Welcome to First Reading, the Old Testament Lectionary Podcast. I'm Rachel Wren. And I'm Tim McNinch. This week on First Reading, Rachel's going to be walking us through some preaching tips on 1 Kings 19, 4-8. The assigned reading for August 8th, 2021, right there in the dog days of summer. Funny enough, we're going backwards in the text. Just last week, I talked about 2 Kings 4, but this week, Rachel, you're talking about 1 Kings 19. And next week, I'm going to tackle 1 Kings 2, and eventually we're going to get back to Genesis, right? Is that how this works? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. So, so Rachel, take us back both in time and chronology. What do you have for us this week? Well, actually, I've been thinking about what you talked about last week, Tim. Um, this idea of how 2 Kings 4 isn't an us-first text, but really one that leads us to care for others, even in the midst of scarcity. And what that got me started thinking about was how this 1 Kings text is about when we not only feel scarcity of resources, but scarcity of selves, and I mean our selves to be exact. Mm, scarcity of self. You mean like sort of like burnout? Well, sort of. Like the text can be taken that way, but I'd like to suggest that there's something somewhat different going on here. In, when we were in Egypt, we used to say it's the same, but different, because that <laughs> just seems to be the mantra there. <laughs> All right. So uh, set it up for us then. What, what do we have here? Okay, so let's backtrack a bit. For our literary context, this is the point in 2 Kings where the years of united rule under Kings David and Solomon are long past. The kingdom has been divided for a few generations now. And the further away from David and Solomon we get, the more things seem to be spiraling out of control, at least from a political standpoint. The period of this week's pericope was, according to the biblical text, a time of an abiding lack of faithfulness on the part of God's people. And it was actually a time of persecution as well, at least for God's faithful ones. Hmm. King Ahab is ruling here. Uh, king Ahab was the seventh king of the northern kingdom of Israel. And 1 Kings 16 actually tells us a bit about him. Uh, Tim, can you read 1 Kings 16, just the chunk that, um, like, verses 29 to 34? Oh, yeah, sure. All right, here we go. In the 38th year of King Asa of Judah, Ahab son of Omri began to reign over Israel. Ahab son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Ahab son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him. And as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam son of Nebat, he took as his wife Jezebel, daughter of King Ethbaal of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made a sacred pole. Ahab did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than had all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days, Hiel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Aviram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sekum. Okay, so what this tells us is, in essence, that Ahab was a really bad dude. Yeah, I picked up on that. <laughs> yeah, right. So he takes all the mistakes of his ancestors and he basically puts them on steroids. He not only worshipped other gods, he became a Baal servant. He not only established an altar for Baal, he built a temple for him. He not only surrounded himself with faithless people, but those faithless people did things like sacrificing their own children just to complete a building project. Yeah, that is a bad dude. Yeah, exactly. According to the text, a really bad dude. And that's where our story for today kind of picks up. So Elijah the prophet has been sent by God to deliver a reckoning to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel to win back the people to God. Elijah's done so in 1 Kings 18, and he celebrates this little victory by killing all of Queen Jezebel's Baal prophets. <laughs> Don't try this at home, friends. Yikes. So King Ahab, who was present for this little victory celebration, he does nothing to try and stop it, but he instead turns tail and tattles to the queen, the true power of the throne here. And she gets mad as all get out. She is not to be trifled with. She rolls up her sleeves, 
winds up her pitching arm and rockets a curse at Elijah. So may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. What she's saying is basically, may the gods strike me down as dead as my Baal prophets if I do not murder you by this time tomorrow. There's the power of the throne right there. Exactly. And in response, Elijah freaks out. In the verse just before today's pericope, we hear about Elijah's state as he went a day's journey into the wilderness. He was afraid. And the verbs in the text actually become sort of frenetic, sort of jumpy at this point. So it, it sounds like this in Hebrew. There's this punchy sound of the first few verbs. It, it's communicating orally the idea that I just said, Elijah is freaking out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so much so that he even leaves his servant behind and just goes himself into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Kind of like he's he's closing in on himself or or isolating himself. Yeah, exactly. Well, and and this is one of the ways where we start to to turn to a modern interpretation of this text, which I think might actually lead us a little bit away from the text. Hmm. The way I've heard this text talked about is in terms of depression. So Elijah heads into the wilderness. He isolates himself from his loved ones. One could say here the servant. Then he sits under a solitary broom tree, and he even asks that he might die. He lays down and he falls asleep because it's just too much for him. Hmm. And, and from there, pastors use this text often to talk about depression or burnout or suicidal ideation. But I think that that's actually one of the preaching pitfalls of this text. Oh, really? Yeah, say more about that. Well, I think that it's one of those texts that sounds like it correlates so clearly to a modern day phenomenon, like here, clinical depression, that we kind of can't help but go there. And, you know, we've all seen the commercials of the person who lies down in a gray fog while life is happening in full technicolor around them. Or, you know, if we haven't undergone it ourselves, we know someone who has gotten to such a point of desperation that even death seems preferable or they just can't function in normal life. So in many ways, this text kind of seems to check all those boxes, so we kind of can't help but go there. But I don't necessarily know that we should. So first of all, diagnosing the psychological issues of the prophets was a really common move in biblical studies in the mid to late 20th century, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the wake of like Freud and Jung, and in the wake of pharmaceutical discoveries, it became really, really popular. It's less popular now, and I think one of the things that, that slowed the roll on that particular trend is that people were taking modern psychological clinical diagnoses, such as depression, mm -hmm. and just sort of laying them on top of the biblical text. When we take a look at the actual clinical definition of depression, we find pretty consistently the following qualities. First of all, that it is a medical illness. Second of all, that the, there's a list of specific symptoms, some of which Elijah demonstrates here. But most importantly, to get this diagnosis, it needs to be a sustained presence of these symptoms for at least two weeks. So the text is pretty clear here that Elijah, while he's in a funk, this isn't a sustained issue that's been going on for over two weeks. Plus, I think when we move too fast to a modern diagnosis of depression, we may miss some explanations that are, are more native to the text itself. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm following you because Elijah's experience is more like an acute phenomenon. Mm -hmm. This is this has happened because of something that just happened right then. Um, so so I'm I'm with you. Take us where you're going here. What are what are some of the more native explanations, as you said? Yeah. Okay. So one possibility is to note that Elijah's request for his life to be over comes out of a culture of honor and shame that's very different from our own. A request for uh, death in our society today is seen as incredibly shameful. Usually, mm -hmm. not always, but that's the people talk a lot about the stigma that comes along with it. Sure. Mm -hmm. In an honor and shame culture, it is actually often the honorable thing to do once one has been gravely dishonored. It's almost a way of restoring honor 
in a society like this. It, now, that's a dangerous thing to preach when you don't know your people's mental state who are sitting in the pew in the congregation. So I wouldn't necessarily go there, but I lift that up as an academic explanation that moves us away from a modern diagnosis of depression. So so let me make sure that I'm understanding what you're saying then. So you're suggesting that perhaps when Elijah says, you know, may I die, it's a, a way of him acknowledging that he's been dishonored. Mm-hmm. Is that is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, he's been dishonored and has dishonored God's name through his dishonoring as well. Mm, so I it's see. actually Elijah's way of trying to to restore the balance here. I see. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, but I, I get how that would be uh, pretty <laughs> sensitive to bring up in a sermon. Yeah. So um, you, you have a different kind of explanation you're thinking. I about? do. I have a different explanation that doesn't suggest that suicide was a way to restore your honor. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> the second explanation is a little bit simpler, and it's it's about kind of thinking Jacob. Thinking Jacob. Yeah. Okay. So you asked, funny enough, you you said, are we going all the way back to Genesis? I am taking us back to Genesis right now, <laughs> okay, actually. Okay. <laughs> so if you pull back in your memory, dear friends, the story of Jacob, you'll probably remember one of the best stories in the whole narrative, which is mm. Jacob's wrestling with the angel or the man or the presence of God, whatever you want to call it. He has a rough and tumble divine experience, you might say. Sure. Yep. In preparation for that, Jacob is stripped of all his worldly possessions that he's built like barriers around him. And not completely. He just sends them away across the river. But there's this idea that meeting God face to face only happens when we are at our most vulnerable. Or perhaps that's when God chooses to show up. I think that that's part of what's happening to Elijah here. He's going to go on in the rest of this chapter to have an extraordinary experience of God. And this sort of stripping away is in some ways preparing him for that. Now, I don't Mm -hmm. often recommend this type of sermon because I think they can be dangerous as well. But I do wonder if this text is leading us towards a sermon that talks about the barriers that we build around ourselves for our own protection. Big scare quotes here. And do those barriers actually end up coming in between ourselves of God? Do we find God in our places of scarcity, whether they're resource scarcity, like you were talking about last week, or maybe a sense of internal scarcity that Elijah might be experiencing here? Or do we, when we find ourselves stripped of our defense mechanisms, do we decide that there's just nothing left? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's a helpful way to think about this text. Elijah's sort of in this process of um, going from like the pinnacle of his career, yeah. this this great victory over the prophets of Baal, and everything that should have given him a sense of confidence and bigness in himself gets stripped away a little bit at a time mm-hmm. until he's at his lowest point. Yeah. And it's at it's at that point that he hears the the small voice of God, right? Yeah, exactly. And and I love this too because it's, you know, at he's at, as he's at this moment sleeping under this tree, the angel shakes him awake twice and says, "Eat, get up and eat." And the second time, "Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you." Mm-hmm. I just I just love that too. I wish every pastor had a plaque with that on <laughs> on their office somewhere. "Get up and eat, otherwise the journey will be too much for you." It's this recognition that this is not an easy thing we do. Any life of faith, not just mm-hmm. pastors, is yeah, not yeah. an easy thing we do. And yet God shows up and says, eat, otherwise the journey will be too much. Mm-hmm. A lot of us feel like we have to be strong individuals mm-hmm. to be strong for God. Mm-hmm. And for for pastors, I mean, all, all of you who are preachers out there, pastors, that sense of needing to carry the burden of God's people mm-hmm. and being strong mm-hmm. to carry that. Yeah. And this is a kind of text that says, no, when all of that gets stripped away, God's still there. God's still able to care for you, yeah. even in those moments of, of profound vulnerability, profound weakness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, Rachel, thanks for helping us to take a look at the vulnerable side of this, of this text. Yeah, you're welcome. It's one of my favorites. <laughs> so surprising to hear you say that. <laughs> right.
Okay, friends, that's going to bring us to the end of this week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. And if you want to catch any of our back episodes, there are two main places you can find us. One is on the web at firstreadingpodcast.com. But we also have a presence on Facebook. We have a Facebook page where we post all of our episodes as well. And there's space there for, you know, some interaction, comments, all of that good Facebooky stuff. <laughs> so uh, find us there. We want to say thanks to Trinity Seminary for uh, giving us a grant that helps us do what we're doing here. And thanks to you all for listening. We so appreciate your investment of your time and attention. And hopefully you all are getting something out of all of this that helps you in the work that you're doing, whether you're a preacher or just somebody who wants to interpret the Bible. Until next time, I'm Tim McNinch. And I'm Rachel Wren. Blessings on the journey. <laughs>